So let's, let's turn our attention to another area in kidney cancer that we struggle with almost daily, and that's the management of oligometastatic disease. So let me set the stage. Oligometastatic disease is the patient that's had a nephrectomy uh, followed by recurrence. Recurrence is in one site, brain, bone. Um, a decade ago, we would look at that as, a, as kind of the tip of the iceberg of what was going to happen elsewhere, and we would treat them as though they had systemic recurrence. Now we recognize that there may be opportunities for treatment of oligometastatic disease that offer patients a, a period of time where they don't require systemic therapy. Eric, when do you use things like surgical resection, radiation therapy, SBRT, for oligometastatic disease recurrences? Great question, and you know, there's clearly a subset of individuals where the timing of disease recurrence or metastatic disease occurrence is relatively slow, and the number of lesions that are occurring are relatively few. And, and so in these types of, of patients, there's a real opportunity, if surgically reasonable and feasible, to, to resect uh, these areas. We have some new technologies coming down the pipeline as well. For example, radiation therapy, focused beam, stereotactic radiosurgery, that can be used in, in various parts of the body as well, um, especially the brain. So uh, the, the, the individuals, we, we think of brain metastases as, as a, a death sentence, a very frightening uh, sign that the patient is going to pass away soon. But that's actually not true in renal cell carcinoma. I have a number of patients who develop solitary or oligometastatic brain metastases, which would I, by, by that I would mean fewer than th three or four, where we treat with stereotactic radiosurgery and then we treat the systemic disease afterwards, and these people do extremely well and actually have good survival. So sort of as a rule of thumb for, for systemic recurrence, if I have a patient that has one or two pulmonary metastases, these are growing slowly, I will have this individual uh, surgically um, treated by my surgical colleagues, and I will not initiate systemic therapy because the interval between that surgery and the next lesions that are going to occur later on can be long-term. And we can spare individuals toxicity of systemic therapy. Yeah, and I think, I think that's something that, that we who treat kidney cancer every day recognize, and that is that you don't have to use all your guns up front. What you want to do is you want to use them sequentially, appropriately, and time off of treatment is a good time for a patient, especially when they have metastatic disease. Uh, there, there is this growing body of, of conversation that talks about uh, radiation therapy as a way to stimulate the immune system um, and the evidence that there might even be something called an abscopal effect, i.e., you give radiation to one area, you get tumor necrosis and apoptosis, and then the immune system reacts and controls cancer elsewhere. Um, Tom, I, I, it's not something that we think about in terms of what we see, but it is something that we think about in terms of the trials that we design. Your thoughts about, you know, the evolving role of radiation therapy in kidney cancer? I think um, there's clearly going to be a role. I think most of the data that has defined kidney cancer as being this radio-resistant tumor comes back from technology of the 1970s. And so uh, our radiation oncology colleagues have often said, guys, let us treat your patients with the newer technology. We may actually have something to bring to bear there. So not only just traditional um, SBRT approaches, um, even proton therapy if there's a way, um, but actually finding ways that you could stimulate or augment antigen presentation um, to the immune system that hopefully you're activating with checkpoint inhibitors. So I think there's, there's a whole rationale in science that you could generate by doing that, and I think that will be incorporated into a lot of new early uh, clinical trials. You know, I think, that, I think that integrating novel radiation approaches with checkpoint inhibition is an obvious place to ask and answer questions in, the, in our clinical research arena. Um, and I think that, that uh, David, in some of the trials that you were involved in, um, was there any observation or any analytic granular data about kind of the so-called abscopal effect other than in theory? There are anecdotes, but right now there are anecdotes, meaning there are some patients who've been progressing while on checkpoints who, because they developed symptoms, got radiation while they were still on treatment, and then we saw some dramatic effects. Uh, they, even one case report got into, I think, the New England Journal and, you know, drew a lot of this interest and excitement. But ultimately, I think we need to encourage our radiation oncology colleagues to do randomized trials. 
Um, and I think they're doing them. They're, they're getting them started. Now that these agents are approved, they're a little bit easier to design those trials and execute those trials. They, the radiation oncologists believe it's real, but I think we just need more data. The exciting thing is if we can prove it, it can be an approach that, we, that crosses multiple cancers, not just kidney cancer, because it's likely to play out in other diseases as well. And Eric, one, one additional question for you is, is are there people with oligometastatic disease that we should not be considering these approaches? I mean, clearly, you know, brain, one to four lesions, a solitary bone lesion, but how do you integrate things like time from nephrectomy to the development of oligometastatic disease, the kind of histology of kidney cancer, sarcomatoid versus clear cell? Do you use those other clinical parameters to help you decide when to uh, approach oligometastatic disease with a surgical or a radiation approach? Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think a perfect example is an individual where you don't have multiple points on the curve, where you don't have several different scans mm -hmm. sequentially demonstrating that the tumors that you're seeing, these metastases you're seeing, are relatively slow growing and are isolated in number. So if you do have a person that comes in and has a few lung lesions and you don't have any antecedent scans, or this is relatively close to the time of nephrectomy, the worry you have is that this individual might actually then develop three or four within the next two to three months. So I think a waiting period, a, a what I would call a, a careful surveillance of that individual over a, a brief period of time would be necessary. Sarcomatoid's another uh, important point. Uh, sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma tends to uh, be more aggressive, especially when you perform surgery. And again, this is sort of on the level of anecdote, but if you're asking my personal opinion, which you are, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, very, I'm much more cautious about an individual who has a sarcomatoid primary who then develops metastases. Because these are those sorts of individuals, it seems that the, 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 the healing factors from surgery seem to spur the growth of sarcomatoid lesions. So I'm very cautious of those individuals. I usually treat them with systemic therapy and cool their disease down for a while. And if I then perform a surgery, I'll then treat them for a period of time afterwards, even if they're free of disease. Again, this is not, this is, this is um, art of medicine, this is not science, but that's what I do with those patients. Yeah, so there was an abstract presented at ASCO yesterday, I think, and Axel Becks talked about it a little bit, and many of these factors that Eric just described came out in this analysis from a European data set that you mentioned, time to recurrence, how many lesions, grade of the tumor, so folks with grade four and sarcomatoid tended to do worse. And so, and then he gave some recommendations about who should have these, you know, local interventions and, and who shouldn't. So there's data, but part, part of the problem with the data is it's a bias. Yeah, it's selected, yes. of course. So, but the one thing I wanted to add as far as these approaches, um, integrating them into therapy is also, I think, very important. One of the things that I struggle with, I don't know about you guys, is when our patients progress, they tend to progress in these same places. The TKIs are very good at <laughs> dealing with soft tissue mets not so good at preventing bone mets, not so good at preventing brain mets. And so you have to integrate these folks, the surgeons, the radiation oncologists, in the course of people's condition to con control their disease. You're often doing two things at the same time. So, so what you're talking about then is a mixed response kind of situation, which yeah. we often face, where you have visceral metastases controlled with therapy, but you either have progression in the bone or brain that's requiring another disciplines right. intervention. Yeah. Right, and I often don't stop the systemic therapy just I because agree. You know, I, the assumption is it's that place where they're going to fail. If you can control that, control it, and then keep if they're tolerating the therapy, keep them. And on I think, it. and I think that we've all seen patients that, as we keep patients alive longer, mm -hmm. sites of unusual metastatic disease start to appear. Right. Uh, pancreas, for example, and and the appropriate use of integrated surgical approaches for metastatic disease late in the biology of that person's cancer. Uh, even though it's an aggressive surgery, can have a very positive outcome. So I, I think that what you've described is basically integrate clinical criteria, grade, time to progression, sites of disease, other agents that have re been received, and, and think about the patient as a whole as you try and address their, their oligometastatic disease. But that, that really leads to the next question, which is, we're still in a very exciting time in kidney cancer. We're talking about checkpoint inhibitors, but we shouldn't forget that checkpoint inhibitors are just one of many questions being asked in the, in the space of clinical trial design. So Tom, let's